Square has been on an interesting journey during the last quarter century. Faced with commercial failure, Square was about to bow out of the gaming world. In 1987, the father of Final Fantasy, Hironobu Sakaguchi, said that his final project would be a fantasy RPG. Of course, we all know, Final Fantasy went on to great commercial success, and Square all of a sudden had a franchise on its hands. The series has seen some good times, as well as some times that we would all like to forget about. Today, I'm looking at the GBA port of Final Fantasy to see what improvements were made to a game that gave a company direction, and to help understand the spirit of a game that has brought joy to millions of gamers all over the world. This is an in-depth review, so there will be spoilers. Just letting you know now. Final Fantasy's maiden voyage, it is the role of the player to guide the four warriors of light on a quest to restore power to the world's crystals. And to put an end to one man's twisted ambition to live forever. Along the way, the party will traverse plains, caves, deserts, they will explore towns, face the challenges of ancient ruins, sail across the mighty oceans, and soar through the sky in your very own airship. There are monsters to slay, people to save, and lots of loot to collect. The plot isn't very complicated, and it's very straightforward. Toward the end, it does get a little convoluted with talk about time loops, but it works. What makes this game different from most modern RPGs is that the player needs to talk to just about everyone, or you may miss important information about locations, people, and you may miss items outright. Ignoring the NPCs results in the player becoming hopelessly lost. There aren't any long cutscenes that tell you exactly where you should go or what you should be doing. That is your job as an adventurer to figure out. Outside of battle, the player will use menus to do just about everything. Check your stats, look over your items, restore your HP with potions, change equipment, even change the color of your text windows, and so on. An important thing to know is that when you are walking around on the overworld, push B and select to look at the world map. The vehicles work perfectly. Just don't expect your boat to sail in shallow water or your airship to land in 
mountains and forests. In towns, you use the money earned by defeating monsters to buy new items, equipment, and magic spells. Spells are split into levels, and a magic user can only use three of each level. For example, there are four level one white magic spells, Cure, Dia, Protect, and Blink. However, your white mage can only learn three at a time. Just keep that in mind. Final Fantasy is a turn-based RPG. The battles work like this. You pick at the commands of each party member and then watch the turn play out. Whom or whatever has the highest speed will attack first, and so forth. In battles, the options Fight, Magic, Items, Equipped, and Flee appear on each party member's window. The battle commands are pretty self-explanatory, so I don't see the need to verbally explain them. You can't run away from bosses, though. Just a quick note about haste and slow spells. In this game, they do not modify your speed. Rather, they increase the number of hits you inflict per turn. That number is determined by the strength stat and the weapon equipped, not your agility. The thing that makes the GBA version of this game different from others is that the infinite use items like the Giant's Gloves can be used over and over again in battle. I believe that in the PSP version they can only be used once per battle. The job system that is now a hallmark in the Final Fantasy series got its start in the very first outing. There are four slots for your team and six classes to choose from. Warrior, Monk, Thief, Red Mage, White Mage, and Black Mage. I have never used a Red Mage. Each class has its own strengths and weaknesses to take into account. Warriors are well balanced and can equip powerful weapons. Monks have high attack but low defense. Thieves are fast, but weaker than warriors. Red mages strike a balance between magic and physical offense, but excels in neither. White mages are weak, but cast healing spells that you will need in the harder battles. And black mages have very low HP, but can learn some very powerful and useful spells. Once you start your game, there's no going back. You can't change your character's jobs. About halfway through, the side quest to upgrade your characters opens up. Every class, except Monk, it's the ability to learn spells, or in the case of magic users, learn even more powerful spells. The new classes are Knight, Master, Ninja, Red Wizard, White Wizard, and Black Wizard. These reap the highest benefits of class changes. I can finally use decent equipment, and can learn Black Magic up to level 4. Most of the items are what you would expect from an RPG. HP and MP restoring potions, and oats for poison and other ailments, and equipment. The main inclusions in this game are the reusable items. For example, the Giant's Glove casts Saber on whoever uses it. Saber is a spell that increases your attack power and accuracy. Other items cast spells like Invisra, Holy, and Flare. They can be used over and over again in battle and will never break. Trust me, for the harder boss fights, you will be using those items quite a bit. There are also items scattered around the game that increase your stats. For example, a golden apple will raise your HP by 10 points. As I said before, you buy spell books to teach your party members magic. All spells have some use, but some are more useful than others. The null spells are great against elemental bosses, but you don't need to lean on them too much. The elemental spells are necessary early on with black and red mages. And as the game goes on, you will find that buffing your melee characters with spells like Haste and Temper will deal much more damage than magic attacks. The spells that I think are the most important for white mages and white wizards are Cure Spells, to restore health to one ally, Heal Spells, to restore health to the party, the Null Spells, Protect, which is for defense boost, Invis, which raises evasion, Fox to heal silence, Stone of Petrify, Escape to get away from dungeons, and life spells. For black mages and black wizards, fire, ice, and thunder spells, temper, haste, slow, teleport, return to the previous floor and to flee, and flare. I did learn all the Dia spells, which is a white magic spell that does damage to the undead, but I didn't use it too often. I think the white mages' magic points are better spent on healing. 
when you first start off, make sure to buy a good supply of potions, antidotes, and tents. The graphics in this game are fantastic. The team did an excellent job of upgrading the visuals while keeping the same feel of the original game. The world map is basic in terms of objects, but you can tell what everything is. The plains are green, the sand in the desert looks good, oceans are blue, and so forth. The towns all look different and are very detailed. Everything from the cobblestone pass in Cornelia, the dying land and ruined buildings of Melmon, the purity of the water in Crescent Lake, the ice crystals of the ice cavern, and the ancient writings on the floor of the Mirage Tower are all crafted beautifully. The true beauty happens in battle. The sprites look much better than on the map. Bigger, more colorful, and animated well. Though I have seen some debate about this, all the party members look like men, even the White Wizard. In a couple of videos I've watched of the PSP game, it looks like the White Wizard has a hairpin. But that doesn't necessarily mean that White Mage and White Wizards are female in that version. I think that when Square Enix ports the game again, they should make sure to include a gender option for the classes. The only thing that bugs me a bit are the monsters. They're static. They attack by flashing white and never move or change during the course of a battle. It's a small gripe that isn't addressed in the main series until 7. The spells are well animated and they look very nice. My personal favorite is Blizzaga. The battle backgrounds are enhanced versions of the map. For example, what looks like a couple of shades of green on the world map actually looks like grasslands in battle. They even added the horizon and some cloud formations. They get even better as the game goes on. My favorite by far is the Mirage Tower. The glyphs on the floor are depicted so effectively that I feel like the characters are in ancient ruins and it isn't the game window dressing. You were always on the move in Final Fantasy. You start in town and then are quickly sent to the castle, followed by ancient ruins. On the way to the port town, you pass through fields, marshes, and even a witch's cave. You'll explore other caves, mountains, volcanoes, and even an ice cavern. You'll visit a desert caravan, traverse an underwater shrine, and even gaze upon the entirety of the world from a flying fortress. A few dungeons even have floor hazards, like this magma that will slowly drain your health. Even though most towns contain the same things, like item shops, inns, sanctuaries, etc., every one of them feels like a unique place with unique problems and quirky characters. For example, in the town of Provoca, pirates have taken over the place and all the townspeople now live in fear. Once you beat down the pirate crew, the people will return to give you information and to thank you for saving their town. Of course, you won't be spending most of your time in the towns. The objective of this game is to light your crystals and defeat the four elemental fiends. To do so, the party must travel through several dungeons. The earth crystal is underground. The place is filled with rocks, and for lack of a better term, earth tones. Mount Glug is an active volcano, and the game follows through with a convincing color scheme and the uh, deadly floors. The sunken shrine is beautiful, yet depressing at the same time. The last of the mermaids live there and depend upon the four warriors to save them from Kraken. The floors are falling apart and the pillars are ruined. The flying fortress is set high above the world. The color palette with the storm clouds rolling in the background make it a visually interesting place to see. I could talk about the various locations and the people therein for quite a while. This game is full of simple, 
yet fascinating characters that the player needs to discover for himself. Where can I begin in this category? The music in the Final Fantasy series is known for memorable and catchy melodies, and the first game certainly started things off right. The themes are not that long, in fact most are a minute or less, and several themes are used over and over again. But how can I mind when they are so well written? I tried to find a couple of themes that I didn't care for as much, but after listening to them again, I found that I actually liked them just fine. However, in my opinion, the dungeon and the airship themes aren't as strong, but still good. Maybe I don't like the dungeon theme as much because it has a creepier vibe than just about everything else in the soundtrack. Most are either, let's take in the scenery, or it's time to take on the world and win. All the themes have very strong melodies, and several have been reused in interesting ways. For example, the castle theme and the track titled, Ruin Castle, use the same melody. But because of the different instrumentation, the tracks have completely different feels. The first is happy and inviting, letting you know that all is well in the kingdom. The second, well, doesn't, as you can hear for yourself. The soundtrack has that unique quality of being able to loop over and over and never become irritating. The music is a big part of why Final Fantasy 1 will remain a timeless classic. Good music never goes out of style. The sound effects are solid overall, even if the earlier sword sounds don't sound quite like swords. Punching, crushing, and magic sounds are also excellent. The standout in my mind is the water effect you hear before going to the second shrine. The only sound effect that doesn't sound quite right to me is when you cast Flare. Just listen. Besides that, there really isn't much to complain about or praise for that matter. The sound effects are solid overall, and few feel out of place. There really isn't a load of options to talk about. In the main menu, you can choose your game, look at the bestiary, and after you complete both games and have a saved clear data, you can access the music player. The bestiary is a list of all the monsters you have fought and subsequently beat down over the course of the game. It shows their stats, weaknesses, and possible item drops. The music player lets you listen to the game's music at your leisure. I really do enjoy the music from Final Fantasy, as I've already told you, so I'm gonna let you listen to a few of the music clips here. There are four bonus dungeons that unlock after beating the corresponding Elemental Fiend. The monsters inside are stronger than most of the random encounters throughout the main areas, so take caution if you enter. Also, take note that you cannot escape using the exit spell. The only ways out are to reach the end, take an early exit, or to die. I didn't go into any of them until I did everything except beat the final boss. I recommend that you wait until you promote and are at least on level 45 before you go. I was on level 62 
and had an easy time with the Earth Gift Shrine and the Hellfire Chasm. Lifespring Grotto has the hardest bosses in the game, and Whisperwind Cove is easy by comparison in terms of bosses. I beat all but the last two bosses in Lifespring Grotto, beat everything in Whisperwind Cove, leveled up to 89, used all the stat boosting items I found, and then beat the final two bosses. All of these bonus dungeons have a few things in common. Random floors with random treasure locations, equipment that does not appear in the main game, and powerful bosses. The Earthgith Shrine is the most basic. It only has five total floors with no puzzles or extra side quests to complete. You just have to fight your way to the bottom. You have to complete this dungeon four times to fight all the bosses. The Hellfire Chasm is a bit more complicated. Several of the rooms have the same health draining magma floors as on Mount Glug. It even has fake world maps where you have to find a ship, talk to a man who says you need a levy stone, which you have because that's what you need to get the airship in the main game, go to the desert to get an airship, and then fly to the exit. This one requires two run-throughs to complete. The Lifespring Grotto opens third, but needs to be completed last. This one provides a couple of new obstacles and objectives, disappearing floors, and having to defeat a certain number of dragons to open a door in Dark Bahamut's cave. This one also has towns filled with dancers that spout off random things, as well as crossover lines about other Final Fantasy games. It takes two run-throughs to complete. Whisperwind Cove has it all. Fetch quests, magma floors, a fairy town, a mage town, which sells excellent items and equipment, a monster graveyard that contains a couple of monsters that still hold a grudge, a cursed castle, and a cursed town. Not to mention a couple of powerful bosses in Typhoon and Death Gaze that both use one-hit kill spells and abilities. This is a 40-floor dungeon, but it only needs one run. The GBA remake really doesn't have a lot of technical problems. Even when there are nine enemies on the screen, I didn't notice any slowdown. It looks and sounds great for a GBA game. If I had to nitpick a little bit, it would be the randomness of the random encounters. Sometimes you can walk forever and not get into a fight, and sometimes you take one step, like that, and then all of a sudden you're back into battle. The encounter rate overall isn't broken, but it just can be frustrating at times. This game is available for many different systems. I have only played the GBA version, so my knowledge of the others is limited. The most available now are the Virtual Console re-release of the original 8-bit game, the GBA port, the PSP remake, and the iOS version that is based after the PSP iteration. Since I have the most experience with the GBA version, I'll talk about that one first. The Game Boy Advance title is not that hard. In fact, it's the easiest version of the game you can get. As long as you start off with a good team and spend a little time powering up, you'll be okay. If you want to give yourself a challenge, choose a team that is comprised of only one class or try to beat the game with just one character. It's possible to win that way. I've only seen it, never tried it, but wait till your second playthrough at least. The only areas that ramp up the difficulty are the bonus dungeons, and you don't have to finish those to beat the game. The NES game is difficult and doesn't allow attack transfer, meaning that if you attack a monster with all four characters and the first attack kills it, the rest of your party's actions are wasted. There are fewer items to buy, status effects are much more debilitating, you can't use items if you're silenced, and you get less money and experience from battle. Also, until the GBA version's release, the magic system is charge-based instead of magic points. Let's take a Black Wizard for example. In the older releases, he can only use level 8 magic like Flare five times before it has to be recharged. I guess with an Ether. The PSP and iOS versions are harder than the GBA one, and offer more bonus areas and even more powerful bosses to slay. 
If you were looking to buy a copy of the game now, I would buy the PSP or the iOS versions. They have more content than any of the others and sell for about 10 bucks on the PSP and $8.99 on the iStore, or whatever they call that. App Store? I don't know, I don't have an iOS anything. Final Fantasy 1 is a great game that originally saved Square from certain doom. Its legacy lives on in the Final Fantasy series, as well as influencing RPGs, Western, and JRPGs to this day. It's a game that has decent replay value because of the different job configurations, the translation from the GBA version onward is excellent and engaging, the sound and music is superb, the turn-based gameplay is fun and more rewarding as the game progresses, and the graphics are mostly pleasant. Final Fantasy isn't perfect though. The random encounter rate is a bit sporadic, and you can get disoriented in a dungeon if you are constantly in battle. Also, even though the battle system is well executed and gets better as the game goes on, it gets a little boring fighting recolors of old monsters and grinding early for experience and money. That just isn't the most exciting thing to do in the world. But the good news is, at least in the GBA version, you don't have to do a lot of grinding. It's a game that was, for me, more fun the second time through than the first. I highly recommend this game to RPG fans, and to people who aren't even sure they like RPGs. This game doesn't hold your hand the whole time, but generally gives you enough information about your next objective so you won't get lost. Final Fantasy gets an 8.5 out of 10 from me. See you at the end of February when we talk about Final Fantasy 2. Until then, later.